Welcome, friends and foes, survivors and killers. Let's sit around the campfire together and talk about Dead by Daylight. Specifically, the Tone 12 story, A Legacy of Deceit. Starring everyone's favourite survivor, Jonah Vasquez. Whenever I make a video being negative about a character, I expect to get a lot of flack for it from people who really like or even main that character. It's part of devastating your opinion on the internet, really. Especially when your opinions are as controversial as many of mine. Which is what made it very telling that my Jonah video was received pretty well. Obviously there are still some detractors, many with very valid points or different interpretations that I respect, but Jonah kinda sucking ass is not exactly an unpopular opinion. When DVD leaks revealed his tone was coming out, a lot of people joked that I'd be angry or upset, but honestly, I wasn't at all. We just come off the back of the best tome ever written, like, tone 12 was an afterthought to me, and I was still riding high on the positivity left over from tome 11. Either the Jonah story would be like Trix's and somehow save the character from the brink of forgettability, which would be incredibly impressive and something I'd love to talk about, or it would be bad and I get to bully Jonah some more, which is fun as well. And spoiler alert guys, um, it's the latter. Jonah's new lore is kinda bad, but to me that's not actually that important at the moment, because despite being very far from good, it's something far, far better than good. Something Dead by Daylight's lore very rarely touches into. Jonah's lore is fun. It's a blast. I'm actually laughing all the way through it because it's just so ridiculous. I'd like to talk about why it's so ridiculous. What went so badly wrong when they're writing it, and why despite all the many, many problems with it, I can't talk about it without smiling. Jonah's tome story follows his investigations on his own into the mysterious messages he intercepted while working for the CIA, on the Signalization Project, his early work before the Quantana attack. He talked about the CIA forcing him off an official investigation once it started to point toward individuals of power and prestige, something that his base lord did touch on. Legacy of Deceit expands on this chapter of Jonah's life by having him chase up on these leads himself, and honestly I think this direction was absolutely the correct one. In my opinion, the problem with Jonah's base law is that he felt too complicit in the CIA's operations despite being conscious of the damage they were doing. This would be excellent if Jonah toned the line like this was criticised sufficiently by the story, which sadly, it wasn't. Setting Jonah apart as his own man operating independently of the CIA was an excellent choice to combat this. It let him be his own man and show his moral backbone without the instructions of the stuffed shirts above him getting in the way. It was a recipe for a genuinely good tome story that reframed Jonah as a wholly different character than my initial interpretations of him. But it failed to deliver on that concept for one simple reason. The writer doesn't seem to know how to write action. And that sounds super dismissive and quite generic, but it's true. It's just bad, it's sloppy. The action feels pointless. Like it's just there for the sake of it. Instead of serving a purpose, and that hurts what the writer is trying to go for by making you completely unable to take it seriously. For starters, it has the issue that about half the tome stories ever written have. It absolutely cannot show it has to tell. I can't help but think they're doing it on purpose at this point, because this has been a criticism of behaviour's tome stories since literally forever, and I know I'm not the only person to make that criticism. Jonah's story reads like a descriptive list of things that happen with very few moments to communicate the impact of the actions on Jonah. The result of this is Jonah not feeling like a person, just a vehicle in which we are conveyed through a series of scenes that we have no reason to care about. It feels like the story is trying to bust you through every action scene and plot element as quickly as possible, and the action is by far the biggest victim of this, because pacing is key to making action in a story good, and Jonah's story showcases perfectly how not to do it. The story follows Jonah as he investigates a missing person, Dean, a school teacher from White Rock, Colorado, who had mentioned in the signals he picked up on the job. Jonah's adventure follows him through a chase in the city centre, into Jonah's motel room, into a homeless camp under a bridge, into a nursing home, into a random forest, in, into a junkyard. And if this sounds chaotic and messy when I read it out, that's because it is. Almost every memory in this tome goes to a place, describes what happens there, and just goes on to the next one. 
sometimes we don't need to go to these places at all. We just turn up at Jonah's apartment, for example, for no reason at all other than just a place to be. If you think of Jonah's story like a spy thriller or an action movie, it's like if Inglorious Bastards started as normal with Landers raid on the farmhouse and then cut immediately to Brad Pitt rallying his team in an olive garden for absolutely no reason at all. With no explanation or justification and never to go back there again. It ruins the pacing and means we're constantly having to adjust to a change in setting making the reading experience jarring. And the language is pretty amateurish, with lots of syntax issues that aren't obviously wrong but just read badly. Part of this, I think, is a symptom of how action-oriented this story is compared to basically any other tome story. Right at the beginning, we're thrust into the action, which is a great way to introduce a story in theory, but the impact of that action is lost by the tell-not-show storytelling style that simply describes what's happening instead of giving us a reason to care about it. The story is too busy telling us that there are pedestrians around and a couple drop their fruit to show us how Jonah's feeling, how his body and mind are responding to what he's doing. Is his heart pounding in his chest, or is he physically up to the job? Is he focusing on an objective, making him ignore his surroundings? Or is he unfocused and just stumbling around, trying to make it out alive? Is he sympathetic with people he's crashing into as he runs, or does he not care? Is he annoyed that they're in his way? Knowing any of these things would help us to illustrate Jonah as a character, to fill him out, show us what he's made of. And they're all mostly absent because the story instead takes its time with pointless background stuff that never becomes relevant or comes up again. When you're writing a short story, you have to be spartan with your details. You haven't got a lot of words to work with, so you've got to use them on things that matter. And Jonah's story refuses to do that. It has so many great opportunities to make Jonah feel more like a person worth caring about. And throws them away on, well, nothing. Jonah's tome clearly wants to be Dead by Daylight's answer to a spy movie, like James Bond or Mission Impossible. But the best action scenes in those sorts of movies work because of how the action frames the characters. Let's compare Jonah's chase scene at the start of his story to this chase scene in Casino Royale, when Bond is pursuing Molica, the bomb maker. It's the first action scene of Daniel Craig's first appearance in the role of Bond. And this scene perfectly showcases the character we've come to know and love over Craig's tenure. Throughout the chase, Molica is fast and acrobatic, scaling the obstacles in his way like he was born to do it. He's skilled and knows his environment, but he's also reckless. He fires wildly on Bond several times without a clear shot, something that will come back to bite him. Meanwhile, Bond doesn't have his target's athleticism, but he's strong, resourceful and practical, navigating an unfamiliar environment with the tools at his disposal. This lets him keep pace with and eventually catch up with Molica. And when the two square off... Molica's recklessness catches up with him, and Bond is able to overpower him. But the destruction Bond leaves in his wake shows how careless he is in pursuit of the mission, and that carelessness becomes a flaw that Bond has to overcome throughout the rest of the movie. The action is thrilling and fun to watch, yes, but it also characterises both Molica and Bond by showing how they spar with each other and tackle problems differently. You know more about Molica and Bond than you did going in. This is something that Jonah's story should have emulated. Jonah and his pursuers pitted against each other in a way that lets both sides show what they're like and what they're capable of. That is the narrative function of action in a story. It's a method of non-expository storytelling, the definition of showing not telling, that can say so much about a character without anyone exchanging a single word. Let's look at Legacy of Deceit's opening section to see how that holds up. What do we learn about Jonah? Well, we learned that he ran away from some people attacking him because he decoded their secret communications and hid in a garbage pile to escape them. And we know this because, um, he just tells us that's what he did. What else did we learn from the chase that's supposed to be so important that the story starts with it? Well, he, um, crashed into a lot of people when he runs about, but that's kind of it. Doesn't exactly paint us a picture of our shy new protagonist, does it? and our bad guys are even worse. We don't even see them for most of the chase, all we know is that they fire a couple of gunshots at Jonah and then 
run past him when he hides in the garbage. They're just two guys in black trench coats with silenced pistols, that's really all we get. Their manner of dress and their silences on their guns suggest that they want to keep things quiet, and yet they chase Jonah through a busy street and shoot at him in public, where they're almost certain to draw attention to themselves. And that's the only detail that we're given. These guys don't get to be a threat to Jonah because they're barely in the story, and yet the whole first chapter, our cold open, is dedicated to Jonah's alleged pursuit by them. They don't really relate to the rest of the story and don't come up again, so I'm not even sure what the point of them was in the first place. You see where I'm going with this, right? There are several action scenes that take up a lot of this tome's narrative real estate. Jonah chases Dean, Dean carjacks Jonah, Dean and Jonah escape the car into the forest, and not a single one of these scenes matters, because the story just tells us what happened, rather than showing us what happened in a way that lets us gain some insight into the action's participants so we can connect with them as characters. Dead by Daylight has had action-focused stories before that showcase the character well. The one that jumps out to me is the hillbilly story A Man Named Boy, that despite being almost entirely action, is still one of the most insightful and intelligent tome stories we've ever had. Let me read a passage to you and listen carefully at the language I use, because you'll be able to see places amidst the action where Max's personality shines through. A boy creeps up behind two deputies he can barely make out in the moonlight. He slowly raises a pointy branch, leaps out, knocks one on the head and thrusts the branch through the mouth of the other before he can yell for help. He stares down at the blood gushing out like a geyser. Reminds him of a scene in the cowboy movie. He approaches the other deputy. The deputy turns and grabs Boy. They roll over the crunching leaves and fallen branches, exchanging blows. Boy manages to wrap his arm around his neck and squeezes. Legs thrash wildly here and there. Boy squeezes until they stop at once. From a scene that's mostly just Max killing two deputies, we can discern a lot about him. He uses a pointy stick and the element of surprise alongside his raw strength, affirming him as resourceful and cunning behind his brutish and simple exterior. But more than that, there's a lot of language that suggests he doesn't have any emotional stock in what happens to these guys. He observes their blood spills like a geyser in a cowboy movie because he doesn't view what he's done as having any moral bearing. Same goes for how he strangles the other deputy. He doesn't stop when he's dead, but when his legs stop moving. It's a very grounded and detached view on violence that moves the plot forward and showcases the kind of person Max is at the same time. Jonah's story doesn't showcase anything special about him except the bits where he basically pauses the story to expose it to the reader about exactly what he's thinking at this precise moment. Whenever he does this, it comes across as very artificial and obvious what the writer is trying to do. Keep you up to speed so you don't get lost and can maybe care about Jonah a bit, now that the plot has been artificially frozen and the writer can pour character stuff over you like a bland, flavourless syrup. It's why Legacy of Deceit is so disappointing on a core level. It doesn't feel like a coherent story. It feels just like a list of places the writer wanted to go and a list of things they wanted Jonah to think. So instead of actually writing the story to tie these things together, they just sent the list to an editor and called it a day. The end result is a mess. The action is turgid, the characters are flat, almost everything that happens is completely pointless, and we learn nothing about Jonah whatsoever. Except, um, we kind of do. At least we learn one thing about Jonah. And it's something that makes me very happy because I know nobody at Behaviour planned for this. We learned that Jonah Vasquez fucking sucks at his job. Let me be clear. I don't think he's a bad codebreaker, we have no reason to believe that. But being this James Bond-style secret agent that the story clearly wants Jonah to be, he's fucking terrible at it. And the more you remember it, the funnier Legacy of Deceit becomes. Let's break down the events of what happens in the story to show you what I mean. Throughout this story, he uh, ruins people's days by crashing into them during a foot chase, jumps in a pile of garbage, stakes out a nursing home badly, then the train CIA agent gets carjacked by a school teacher and tops it off by pulling a gun on Evan McMillan, if the cinematic is to be believed anyway. There's even evidence to suggest that he lost his gun and got a new one at some point, because in the story he's got a revolver, but in the animation he has something that looks more like a Sig Sauer P228. 
Or maybe the story and cinematic guys just don't talk to each other much, but I like Joe losing his gun more. The only bit of action-y spy work he gets right is when he attacks those two guys who are following them, and smashes one guy over the head with the butt of his 9mm double stack magazine fed revolver. And, um, wait a second, the guys from Dean's apartment? When did we ever go to Dean's apartment? I... I, I think that's the guys from the start, so I guess they do come back, but it's so easy to miss, because it's never acknowledged that the two guys from the start attacked Jonah when he was searching Dean's apartment, because the story was too busy talking about yellow sedans and puddles. Ugh, it feels like this story was written by a fax machine, I swear to God. But yeah, Jonah's not the best at actual field work if you look at what he manages to accomplish in this story. That's something that I really like about Legacy of Deceit. He's a mathematician, not a field agent. He's investigating something well out of his comfort zone and there's a sense of levity to it when you look back on it and realise just how out of his depth he is. No matter what the writer wants, he isn't James Bond or Jason Bourne. He's Austin Powers or Johnny English. And viewing his character like that makes him much more palatable. Hell, it's not just limited to this story. Everything from how he dresses to the quotes he has for his perks, there's something genuinely funny about Jonah and I wish behaviour understood that. Jonah would be an ideal comic relief character. This intelligent and well-meaning man who's nevertheless utterly out of his depth, dealing with cults and secret organisations, kind of like those classic spy comedies like Austin Powers. The only problem with that interpretation of the character is his base story. Because his base story takes itself so seriously and handles some very grave topics, it becomes very hard to lighten Jonah's character, without seeming to piss over the graves of all the people that he killed. This and his release alongside one of the most solemn and tragic killers I've ever written means Jonah can't be comic relief, no matter how well suited he'd be to it. And while I know this story didn't intend to turn Jonah into a joke, his story falls apart so completely when you look at it the way that it clearly wants to be looked at. As a serious story about Jonah investigating the Black Veil's corrupting influence, it doesn't work because the pacing is garbage, most of the time is wasted, and you don't care about any of the characters. The story is so bad it's good, and by Jonah's standards that's a significant improvement. All things considered, this story wasn't as bad as it could have been. It doesn't have the unintended pro-imperialism message of the base law, and it sets Jonah apart from the CIA in a way that, in theory, was promising. The problem is very simply that this story isn't written as well as it deserves. Whoever wrote this story doesn't seem to know what they're doing, and fell into a lot of the pitfalls behaviourist law has done before. It's not often I think a promising story is a casualty of bad language use, but this is a textbook definition, and I hope whoever wrote and edited this story doesn't make these mistakes again. That's everything I have to say about Jonah, at least for the foreseeable future. I know this is a bit of a um, step down from my glowing review of Wesker, but let's be real, you got to cover the crap stuff too. Next video is going to be a deep dive on Ada Wong, so if you want to watch that, then by all means subscribe if you're new to the channel. I'm currently away from my PC visiting family, but I've still got scripts on the go, so don't worry, even on holiday, I'm still working. In the meantime, you can check the links in the description for my Twitch, my Twitter, my Discord server, and my Patreon, if that content is worth your money. Patrons want to see this video a day early, so if you're interested in that early access and a few other sweet perks, by all means check it out, help support the channel, and gets you some nice bonuses, so it's a win for everyone. Down there you can also find a link to Wraith Energy, long-term partners of the channel from whom you can buy sugar-free and tasty energy drinks without the crash. Do go check them out, and if you do, remember to use my code PICK20 for 20% off your purchase. Well that's all from me, and I'll see you when I get back, so ta-ta for now.